Reading 53 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Ospinsky by Dr. Maurice Nicole. Volume 2. Berlip, January 7, 1945. Commentary on Memory. On one occasion, Mr. G said in so many words, in speaking of the first conscious shock, quote, man should remember himself, and he was born to do so. If you ask me what the work is about at this stage, it is about self-remembering. At this place, in the three octaves, something is missing in the present state of humanity. Therefore, it is necessary now to give the shock of self-remembering, which should be given naturally. The trouble is that even when people begin to understand what self-remembering means, they forget to remember themselves. It is necessary to create a memory for self-remembering, and for this reason one must make many alarm clocks to wake oneself up. People may even wish to remember themselves, but they forget to remember that they have to remember themselves. End quote. On another occasion, he spoke about the different kinds of memory that we have. And in his earlier teaching, Mr. O explained to us that we must try to observe different kinds of memory in ourselves. He said each center, each part of a center, and each subdivision of a center had its own kind of memory. This means that each eye has its own memory, because eyes are arranged in a certain order and live in these different parts of centers. We have, for example, very trivial memories which really belong to small eyes in small parts of centers. We remember how we lost a bus or a train years ago, and so on. Now, Mr. O said that all memories are necessary, but he spoke about the education of memory, saying that if we can only remember very small things, we cannot remember big things, and that if we always lived in small eyes, we could not, for example, remember the work. He said that every part of a center is useful, except the negative part of emotional center. <clears throat> He added that the negative part of emotional center is unfortunately divided into smaller and bigger parts, just as every other part of a center is. The bigger or more internal part of the negative part of emotional center is capable of remembering insults all one's life. This is not trivial memory. On the contrary, such deep negative emotions make a man wait for years to have his revenge. The reason why it is more persistent is because it is in bigger eyes in the negative parts of the emotional center. Small eyes forget. Bigger eyes remember more persistently. Some people have very deep-seated negative memory that destroys their lives. You know perhaps people who say they will never forget or forgive. It is curious how they take a certain pride in saying this but it is like a deep ulcer in them and will always bind them to life and hold them down and prevent any new way of thinking and feeling. Now, let us stop speaking about unpleasant forms of memory with which most of our lives are filled. Let us try to think of obviously different kinds of memory. Since every center and every part of a center and every subdivision of a center has a different kind of memory, we should expect to observe different kinds of memory in life. For example, some people have a very good memory for tunes but cannot remember the words of a song, whereas some people can remember the words but not the tune. Here, obviously, are two different kinds of memory. Again. Some people may remember ordinary tunes, and some may remember whole operas. These, again, are different memories of which we might say that those who remember ordinary tunes remember in a smaller part of a center, and those who remember whole operas remember in a bigger part. Again, some people remember figures very well, impersonally or personally. They remember impersonal things like the national debt, or more personally, the rate of interest on some investment, or still more personally, the fares to somewhere. They figure out things and calculate. 
This is a quite different memory from mathematical calculation or from higher mathematics. It is connected, but mathematics is in a higher part of the center. A capacity for figuring we might put in the formatory center, but a capacity for mathematics we must put in at least the emotional part of the intellectual center, and a capacity for higher mathematics probably in the intellectual part of the intellectual center. We will remind ourselves later on as to what has been said about the different parts of centers and their subdivisions. Now, some people have a very good memory for faces, probably with no names attached. On the other hand, people may remember names very well. You may have a very good memory for what has happened in your lives as regards purely external events, whereas other people do not have this memory clearly, but remember their psychological states, how they felt, what they thought. Some people cannot remember a book, but can remember the ideas contained in it, and so on. Sometimes there are very highly developed forms of memory, as in youthful prodigies who can remember, let us say, a whole column of a newspaper read out to them once, or who have an extraordinary memory for historical dates. Generally speaking, prodigious memory of this limited kind is a bad sign because it becomes the precocious development of one small part of a center at the expense of the development of all the other parts. There are many examples of different kinds of memory, but it is impossible to give them here, but I would advise you to see where your memory is good and where it is bad. All memories have their uses. The main point is to realize there are many different kinds of memory and that these different kinds of memory have different qualities. Mr. O once said somewhere that some people took pleasure in saying that they were absent-minded, like the professor who always forgot his umbrella. He was speaking of the idea of balanced man in whom all centers work equally, that is, not one-sided man or small part man. He said it would be necessary if this professor came into the work for him to learn never to forget his umbrella because it meant that there was something missing in him. Now, in using these different kinds of memory, we should realize first that there are different kinds of memory and that we should be able to re call them, to call them up when necessary. For example, I may not remember a great many things at this moment, but I should be able to remember when called upon. I want to say something here about memory that you may not understand. Memory does not mean always remembering everything, such as what bus to catch, how to cook a goose, how to add up figures, how to drive a car, what you read last year, or what you learnt in school. Memory is something we call upon at the appropriate moment. A man with a good memory means a man who has a good, available memory that he can call upon at the right time. It does not mean a man who is able to remember everything all at once. At this moment, for instance, I do not remember my memory. It may so happen that I am thinking of nothing, remembering nothing. If some small parrot, I, says, you do not remember anything. And how extraordinary it is that so many little mechanical eyes tempt you in this way. One should learn to pay no attention. Attention always means use of force. For this reason, memory can be compared with a great library, or to use the work expression, with a great number of phonograph rolls, all arranged in a certain way. Our centers are stored with these phonograph rolls of every kind, and when we remember, one of these rolls turns and speaks to us. In this library of phonograph rolls or books, a man with a good memory knows in which department he can find what he wants. You all know quite well the state in which you feel that you could remember something but cannot for the moment. This means that you must find the way to enter the library and go to the right department and right floor because memory is on different floors. That is, there is <clears throat> higher memory and lower memory. So
So memory in general is like a library. This library is divided into many floors and departments. A man with a good memory knows in which department, on which floor, he can find the book he wants. This may take a little time, but if he has taken in his impressions to a certain extent consciously, he will be able to find the book he needs eventually. If, however, he has taken in his impressions mechanically, that is, without any interest or affection, he will not be able to find the way in his library. Although, curiously enough, his library is arranged quite correctly. What arranges his library? It is best to answer this question by saying that his library is arranged, but he is deranged in regard to it. Just as all his centers and parts of centers are there already and arranged in the right order, so is all his life recorded and arranged in the right order in him, but he is not in contact with it. At the moment of death, we sometimes remember everything, see everything, know everything. We see what it has all amounted to. It is all there in the time body both rightly arranged and wrongly arranged. Also, when we have moments of awakening, we see how things are rightly arranged and how wrongly we are identified with certain things which are not important. Unless things were rightly arranged, we could not see this. We would not know that we had wrongly arranged them. But we are not speaking of great memory, of fully conscious memory, of this book of life that is opened at death. When it is opened, everything is there in right, in its right order, and from that we are judged by ourselves. Now, let us take emotional memory. As you know, emotional memory can be divided into the memory belonging to the negative part and the memory belonging to the non-negative part of emotional center. I have often thought that this is one of the most striking examples of different kinds of memory. When we are negative with a person, it is extraordinary how unpleasant and apparently long forgotten things present themselves in the sphere of our consciousness and wish to escape through our mouths, even things that we really thought were over and done with long ago. On the other hand, when we become sane again, we cannot understand how we behaved as we did. <clears throat> we feel quite contrary feelings, which often take a stupidly exaggerated form and express themselves in quite useless sentiment, which, of course, makes it much easier for us to be negative again because we feel we have justified ourselves. It is only false personality that has justified itself. The only remedy for this is either to see the same things in yourself, that is, through self-knowledge, or to bring together consciously all you know about the good side of a person and confront your negative feelings with that. We always seem to see people either one way or another way, and this is the case even with people who have a picture of themselves as being very tolerant. These two kinds of memory in the emotional center should become a matter of continual conscious experience to all of you. Never believe in your negative states and their memories, because they are always wrong, because they are one-sided. And remember also that with such memories, if they become active and control you, you destroy your own development because no one can develop through no negative emotions and their memories. They have to be let go without argument, just as you let go a thing that has a bad smell. This purification of the emotional center and its memories is very difficult and long work. But if you will keep the ideas of the work clearly before you, and remember that negative emotion can only breed negative emotion. If you remember that violence can only create further violence, if you remember that nothing real can ever grow in negative parts of emotional center, nothing except lies and falsity, if you remember that no one can reach even a trace of real I if he is venomous, 
full of hatred and self-pity and depression. Then perhaps very gradually, keeping all these things in mind, as well as the whole idea of the work, you will be able to have shorter negative states. This is the dirt that has to be cleared away from us before anything else can happen. This is the dirty mind that has to change. But first, one has to observe one's negative states, and you will often find people who assure you they are never really negative, even those who are all the time enjoying their negative emotions to the full. <clears throat> I will remind you of what Mr. O once said about negative emotions. He was talking about false schools, where rules were given that were impossible to keep. He said in so many words, quote, It is quite easy to say in a school that people have no right to be negative, but saying that means that man can do. A man who under all circumstances does not become negative is already a conscious man. What I say to you is this, I say that you have a right not to be negative. End quote. Now, if you are foolishly sincere and simply express your negative thoughts and feelings in every situation, you are not being sly man. One can always plunge into any situation with all one's ordinary negative ways of taking it. What we have to learn in the work is to take situations in a more conscious way so that we get through them without becoming completely identified. <clears throat> As you know, we identify with our negative states very easily. Here we have to remember ourselves to remember what the work is teaching us. We have to remember that we have to endeavor not to react mechanically and to Try to think what it means to be cleverly sincere. To be cleverly sincere, one must be sincere to one's understanding of the work. This can help a great deal, and this is where memory is consciously applied. I must remember myself in this situation. This is an example of work on oneself. It is not the same as being cautious or wary in a life sense. It has quite another origin. Being cautious in a life sense is going with your mechanicalness. You are mechanically cautious, but the above example is about acting consciously against one's mechanicalness, against oneself. Now, as regards memory in the moving center, here lie all kinds of extraordinary memories. Memory for walking, for skating, for writing, for speaking, for balancing, for bicycling, for eating, for sewing, for knitting, for doing everything with your hands and with your feet. These memories are acquired, but some are born, such as the memory for sucking. The work teaches that centers are born blank like smooth wax and are impressed by impressions from life. The great exception is, of course, the instinctive center, which is fully developed at birth. Otherwise, digestion, etc., would have to be learnt. The instinctive center <clears throat> attends to the inner work of the organism and is itself the representation of the organic life cosmos in man, or what is ordinarily called nature. The cleverness of this center is beyond all computation. It is, for example, a 10,000 times better chemist than any actual chemist or physiologist. Without this starting point, man could not exist on the earth. He is given this first of all, and also a small development of the moving center, but nothing else. This is not quite correct, because he is also given higher centers, fully developed, that are always at work in him, but he is not in contact with them. They represent higher cosmoses in man. Now, in the instinctive center lie memories of sensation. Some people say they can recall their sensations. This may be true, but from my own observation, I do not remember the actual sensation, but something 
disembodied. For example, if I say to you, what is the difference between eating strawberries and plunging into ice cold water, you will know the difference. But the sensations are disembodied, ghost-like. When you are eating something that gives you a particular sensation of taste, smell, consistency, you are reminded of other similar sensations by association. This is memory of sensations. Or when you eat a thing said to be lamb and it is not, you know it is not. This means there is memory for different sensations, but I do not think this memory is easily recallable voluntarily. Sensation works in the present moment only, just as all the senses do. Thought, for example, is different. You can recall the memory of a thought you had yesterday, but I would say you cannot recall in the same way a sensation. Thought is independent of the senses, which only work in the present moment of time, and in fact make the present moment of time. But some trains of thought are timeless, and you have to come back to your senses to know what time it is. If we could recall sensations in their totality, we should never move away from agreeable sensations. But in recollection, they are very thin. People forget their sensations, such as those due to war, very easily. If you could recall fully the sensation of being warm, you would never be cold. Certainly, it is possible to create warmth, and some yogi schools teach this first of all, but it is done through the mind and not through recall. <clears throat> Let us now speak of the connection between memory and association. In connection with this enormous subject, we must remember that all associations are connected with memory. The lowest level is automatic. The highest level is through corresponding ideas. Say you swing your arm round and suddenly begin to talk about cricket, how you used to bowl for your 11. You do not know why you talk about cricket, but the movement, as it were, rings up memories of cricket. This is automatic. This side of our life is constantly at work, only we do not notice it. For example, if you sit in a certain position, you may become negative. This is because you have been negative before when sitting in that position. Some other time we will speak more fully about associations, which are one aspect of memory. But I must say here that all that has been written above and all that follows belongs to the study of the human machine. The work teaches us that we must know our human machine and catch glimpses of how it works. When we take ourselves for granted, or take ourselves as one big I, always the same, it makes it impossible for us to work on ourselves. We are like a city full of different people, some of whom are very troublesome, <clears throat> as long as we take them as I. And this city is full of used and unused roads. The realization of this does not lead to the loss of the feeling of oneself, but rather leads to the loss of the wrong feeling of oneself. Or, to take the work phrase, we must realize we are a house in disorder and nobody is in charge. Then, take the formatory part of the intellectual center, the moving part. Here lies the memory for words, phrases, all our ordinary orientation to life small plans, catching buses, and so on. All these are different memories in subdivisions in which live different eyes that attend to these matters and have been trained to do so. Next, I want to talk to you about memory in the higher parts of ordinary centers and how it differs from memory in smaller parts or memory in bigger eyes in contrast to memory in smaller eyes. In the first place, it is impossible to remember oneself in small eyes, and it is merely a waste of time. In fact, it is worse than a waste of time because it drags the whole work down to a very small level. 
The work cannot fall on small eyes, which cannot understand it, and which are turned towards life, and are necessary for life. So if you go about in your daily life and simply, suddenly, try to remember yourself because some little parrot eye tells you to do so, one of those little nagging eyes that give you an entirely false sense of duty, then simply laugh at such nonsense. The act of self-remembering must have a certain emotional quality. It is owing to the emotional quality that one is put at once into higher parts of centers into bigger eyes. These can remember the work. They can understand it. No one can work continuously, but only at times. But it is possible to keep awake a little all the time, and at least to observe oneself. Self-observation should accompany our ordinary life, and can do so. But self-remembering is on a quite different level. Self-observation can lead up to self-remembering when one notices one is forgetting one's aim. Now, in self-remembering, all the memory of the work enters, not necessarily consciously, but by a high level of association. Eyes that are in higher parts of centers have a far more comprehensive memory than that of little eyes that stand, as it were, close to the ground and have a very limited vision. These bigger eyes can take in two or three things together and relate them because they have a wider vision. That is why the memory of these eyes is quite different. They can, as it were, take in the whole of a subject, whereas little eyes can take in only one small part, and for this reason they continually argue inside one and catch hold of little contradictions. It is a great misfortune to be judged by other people, by little eyes, and this is, after all, the general human situation. You get into bigger eyes either through an emotional state or through attention. Directed attention, which has to deal with the work ideas, can put you into an emotional state or even a book that contains B influences. This makes it possible to remember yourself because it puts you into a chain of conscious associations voluntarily acquired, or rather acquired by choice. Here the memory of everything is quite different because everything is in the right order. It is a very wonderful thing when this begins to happen to you. That is, when you begin to touch real self-remembering. Of course, if you worry about self-remembering, or do it as your duty, merely, you will not reach this state because you start from the wrong place. It is the whole feeling of the work that makes it possible to remember oneself. And it is also the whole memory of the work that makes it possible. But this memory is not the same as the ordinary memories we use for life. It is like going into another room. If there is nothing there, then there can be no self-remembering in a real sense. If you remember your origin and feel it emotionally enough, you may touch the level of self-remembering, and then <clears throat> you may remember many other things that long ago you have forgotten. This is special memory, where things are joined together by similar emotional states, by a similar taste. And here you often find many things that you may have thought have been no good, things you have tried to do, things you thought you had failed in. You find them there in this special memory. But you can find nothing there that you thought you did well and deserved credit for. Remember that each center feels and that every division of a center feels. And all these feelings are of different qualities and call up their memories. This is why so much insistence is laid on evaluation of the work because evaluation is feeling and it is through feeling the work that we get into contact with eyes in ourselves that can work and can self-remember and can lead to the state of self-remembering. 
Feeling for the work develops through feeling when you have wrong feelings about the work. No one can feel rightly, but people can become more conscious of when they feel wrongly. By inner separation, by non-identifying, and by dislike of wrong feelings or discomfort about them, it may be made possible for right feelings to enter. When we have experienced some moments of right feeling, we remember them afterwards in ordinary life in an inverse way, namely through feeling that we have not got the right feelings. This action of memory is the most interesting of all. If we were not given occasionally inner perceptions and experiences a little above our ordinary level, we could not grow. The point is, we do actually have traces of experiences beyond our ordinary level. This is one of the most remarkable things about our human existence and points to our having something more in us than we are. If you will think of the side octave from the sun, you will see the explanation. Now, you will see why in the work memory is taken as one of the most important of all things and why the purification of memory is so important. To keep the memory of useless things alive is not the right use of memory. Memory must become selective. On one occasion, Mr. O, in speaking of what he would ask for if he had three wishes, said, quote, One thing would be to be able to forget what I would like to forget, and to remember what I want to remember. Now, we forget things by reducing their importance, and we remember things by increasing their importance. Some things we must starve in ourselves, and some things we must feed. And the work teaches us what we have to starve and what we must feed. But one of the most important ways of altering memory is by canceling debts through seeing the unpleasant things we attribute to others as also existing in ourselves. And this is one of the great uses of self-observation. This checks the growth of unpleasant memories and also changes us. This kind of work on yourself is always possible at any moment wherever you are and begins as soon as you reach the stage of being able to notice when you are taking in unpleasant impressions, either from outside or from memory. <laughs>